The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T. S. Eliot Read for LibriVox.org by Sam Fold Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go, through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels, and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent, to lead you to an overwhelming question, oh do not ask what is it, let us go and make our visit. In the room the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo, the yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed there will be time, for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes, there will be time, there will be time, to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet, there will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate, time for you and time for me and time yet for a hundred indecisions, and for a hundred visions and revisions, before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare? And do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair, with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say, how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons, I have measured out my life with coffee spoons, I know the voices dying with a dying fall, beneath the music from a farther room, so how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt-ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight, down with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of the lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. I should have been a pair of ragged claws, scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening, sleeps so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor, here beside you and me, should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis. But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head, grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, 
and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it, after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me? Would it have been worth while to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one, settling a pillow by her head, should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it, at all. And would it have been worth it, after all? Would it have been worth while, after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this, and so much more? It is impossible to say just what I mean, but as if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen. Would it have been worth while if one, settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl, and turning toward the window, should say, That is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I'm an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt, an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, and meticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost, at times, the fool. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing, each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back, when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea, by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown, till human voices wake us, and we drown. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ave Imperatrix by Oscar Wilde Read for LibriVox.org by Kristen Hughes Set in this stormy northern sea, Queen of these restless fields of tide, England, what shall men say of thee, Before whose feet these worlds divide? The earth, a brittle globe of glass, Lies in the hollow of thy hand, And through its heart of crystal pass, Like shadows through a twilight land. The spears of crimson suited war, the long white-crested waves of fight, And all the deadly fires which are the torches of the lords of night. The yellow leopard strained and lean, The treacherous Russian knows so well, With gaping blackened jaws are seen Leaping through the hail of screaming shell. The strong sea-lion of England's wars Hath left his sapphire cave of sea, to battle with the storm that mars the star of England's chivalry. The brazen-throated clarion blows across the Pathan's reedy fen, and the high steeps of Indian snows shake to the tread of armed men. And many an Afghan chief who lies beneath his cool pomegranate tree clutches his sword in fierce surmise, when on the mountain side he sees the fleet foot Mari scout, who comes to tell how he hath heard afar the measured roll of English drums beat at the gates of Kandahar. 
for southern wind and east wind meet, where girt and crowned by sword and fire, England, with bare and bloody feet, climbs the steep road of wide empire. O lonely Himalayan height, gray pillar of the Indian sky, where sawst thou last in clanging fight our winged dogs of victory? The almond groves of Samarkand, Bokhara where red lilies blow, and Oxus, by whose yellow sand the grave white-turbaned merchants go, and on from thence to Ispahan, the gilded garden of the sun, whence the long dusty caravan brings cedar and vermilion, and that dread city of Kabul, set at the mountain's scarped feet, whose marble tanks are ever full with water for the noonday heat. Where through the narrow straight bazaar a little maid Circassian is led, a present from the Tsar unto some old and bearded Khan. Here have our wild war eagles flown, and flapped wide wings in fiery fight. But the sad dove that sits alone in England, she hath no delight. In vain the laughing girl will lean to greet her love with love-lit eyes, down in some treacherous black ravine, clutching his flag the dead boy lies. And many a moon and sun will see the lingering wistful children wait, to climb upon their father's knee, and in each house made desolate, pale women who have lost their lord will kiss the relics of the slain, some tarnished epaulet, some sword, poor toys to soothe such anguished pain. For not in quiet English fields are these our brothers lain to rest, where we might deck their broken shields with all the flowers the dead love best. For some are by the Delhi walls, and many in the Afghan land, and many where the Ganges falls through seven mouths of shifting sand, and some in Russian waters lie, and others in the seas which are the portals to the east, or by the wind-swept heights of Trafalgar. O wandering graves, O restless sleep, O silence of the sunless day, O oh, still ravine, O oh, stormy deep, give up your prey, give up your prey. And thou whose wounds are never healed, whose weary race is never won, O oh, Cromwell's England, must thou yield for every inch of ground a son? Go crown with thorns thy gold-crowned head, change thy glad song to song of pain. Wind and wild wave have got thy dead, and will not yield them back again. Wave and wild wind and foreign shore possesses the flower of English land. Lips that thy lips shall kiss no more, hands that shall never clasp thy hand. What profit now that we have bound the whole round world with nets of gold, if hidden in our heart is found the care that groweth never old? What profit that our galleys ride, pine forest-like on every main? Ruin and wreck are at our side, grim warders of the house of pain. Where are the brave, the strong, the fleet? Where is our English chivalry? Wild grasses are their burial sheet, and sobbing waves the threnody. O oh, loved ones lying far away, what word of love can dead lips send? O oh, wasted dust, O oh, senseless clay, is this the end? Is this the end? Peace, peace we wrong the noble dead to vex their solemn slumber so. Though childless, and with thorn-crowned head, Up the steep road must England go. Yet when this fiery web is spun, Her watchmen shall decry from far, The young republic, like a sun, 
rise from these crimson seas of war. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ballad of One-Eyed Mike by Robert Service Read by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, February 2007 The Ballad of One-Eyed Mike This is the tale that was told to me By the man with the crystal eye As I smoked my pipe in the campfire light And the glories swept the sky As the north lights gleamed and curved and streamed And the bottle of hooch was dry A man once aimed that my life be shamed And wrought me a deathly wrong I vowed one day I would well repay, but the heft of his hate was strong. He thonged me east and he thonged me west, he harried me back and forth, till I fled in fright from his peerless spite to the bleak, bald-headed north. And there I lay, and for many a day I hatched plan after plan, for a golden hall of the wherewithal to crush and to kill my man. And there I strove, and there I clove, through the drift of icy streams, and there I fought, and there I sought for the pay streak of my dreams. So twenty years, with their hopes and fears, and smiles and tears and such, went by and left me long bereft of hope of the Midas touch, about as fat as a chancel rat, and lo, despite my will, in the weary fight I had clean lost sight of the man I sought to kill. T'was so far away that evil day when I prayed the Prince of Gloom For the savage strength and the sullen length of life to work his doom. Nor sign nor word had I seen or heard, and it happed so long ago. My youth was gone, and my memory wan, and I willed it even so. It fell one night in the waning light by the Yukon's oily flow, I smoked and sat as I marveled at the sky's port winey glow, till it paled away to an absinthe gray, and the river seemed to shrink, all wobbly flakes and wriggling snakes and goblin eyes a wink. Twas weird to see, and it wildered me in a queer hypnotic dream, till I saw a spot like an inky blot come floating down the stream. It bobbed and swung, it sheared and hung, it romped round in a ring. It seemed to play in a tricksome way, it sure was a merry thing. In freakish flight strange oily lights came fluttering round its head, like butterflies of a monster size. Then I knew it, for the dead. Its face was rubbed and slicked and scrubbed as smooth as a shaven pate. In the silver snakes that the water makes it gleamed like a dinner plate. It gurgled near and clear and clear and large and large it grew. It stood upright in a ring of light and it looked me through and through. It weltered round with a woozy sound and ere I could retreat, with a witless roll of a sodden soul, it wantoned to my feet. And here I swear by this cross I wear, I heard that floater say, I am the man from whom you ran, the man you sought to slay, that you may note and gaze and gloat and say revenge is sweet, in the grit and grime of the river's slime I am rotting at your feet. The ill we rue we must e'en undo, though it rive us bone from bone, so it came about that I sought you out, for I prayed I might atone. I did you wrong, and for long and long I sought where you might live, and now you're found. Though I'm dead and drowned, I beg you to forgive. So sad it seemed, and its cheekbones gleamed, and its fingers flicked the shore, and it lapped and lay in a weary way, and its hands met to implore, that I gently said, Poor restless dead, I would never work you woe. Though the wrong you rue you can ne'er undo, I forgave you long ago. 
Then wonder-wise I rubbed my eyes, and I woke from a horrid dream. The moon rode high in the naked sky, and something bobbed in the stream. It held my sight in a patch of light, and then it sheared from the shore. It dipped and sank by a hollow bank, and I never saw it more. This was the tale he told to me, that mad so warped and gray. Ere he slept and dreamed, and the campfire gleamed in his eye in a wolfish way. That crystal eye that raked the sky in the weird auroral ray. End of The Ballad of One-Eyed Mike by Robert Service Read by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, February 2007《The Ballad of the Heart Weaver》by Anna St. Vincent Millay, read for LibriVox.org by Linda Liu. Son, said my mother, when I was knee high, you've need of clothes to cover you, and not a rag have I. There's nothing in the house to make a boy breeches, nor shears to cut a cloth with nor thread to take stitches. There's nothing in the house but a loaf end of rye and a harp with a woman's head nobody will buy. And she began to cry. That was in the early fall when came the late fall. Son, she said, the sight of you makes your mother's blood crawl. Little skinny shoulder blades sticking through your clothes and where you'll get a jacket from God above knows it's lucky for me lad your daddy's in the ground and can't see the way I let his son go around and she made a queer sound that was in the late fall when the winter came I not a pair of breeches nor a shirt to my name I couldn't go to school or out of doors to play, and all the other little boys passed our way. Son, said my mother, come, climb into my lap, and I'll shave your little bones while you take a nap. And oh, but we were silly for half an hour or more, me with my long legs dragging on the floor. A rock, rock rocking to a mother goose rhyme. Oh, but we were happy for half an hour's time. But there was I, a great boy, and what would folks say to hear my mother singing me to sleep all day in such a daft way? Men say the winter was bad that year. Fuel was scarce and food was dear. A wind with a wolf's head howled about our door, and we burned up the chairs and sat upon the floor. All that was left us was a chair we couldn't break, and the harp with a woman's head nobody would take for song or pity's sake. The night before Christmas I cried with a cold, I cried myself to sleep like a two-year-old, and in the deep night I felt my mother rise and stare down upon me with love in her eyes. I saw my mother sitting on the one good chair, a light falling on her from I couldn't tell where, looking nineteen and not a day older, and the harp with a woman's head leaned against her shoulder, her thin fingers moving in the thin tall strings were weave, weave, weaving wonderful things. Many bright threads from where I couldn't see were running through the harp strings rapidly, and gold threads whistling 
through my mother's hand, I saw the web grow and the pattern expand. She wove a child's jacket, and when it was done, she laid it on the floor and wove another one. She wove a red cloak, so regal to see. She's made it for a king's son, I said, and not for me. But I knew it was for me. She wove a pair of breeches, quicker than that. She wove a pair of boots and a little cocked hat. She wove a pair of mittens. She wove a little blouse. She wove all night in the still, cold house. She sang as she worked and the harp strings spoke, her voice never faltered, and the thread never broke. And when I awoke, there sat my mother, with the harp against her shoulder, looking nineteen and not a day older, a smile about her lips, and a light about her head, and her hands in the harp strings, frozen dead and piled up beside her, and toppling to the skies, were the clothes of a king's son, just my size. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Goblin Market by Christina Rossetti Read for LibriVox.org by Beth Peet at Reading, UK Morning and evening maids heard the goblins cry, Come buy our orchard fruits, come buy, come buy, Apples and quinces, lemons and oranges, Plump unpicked cherries, melons and raspberries, Bloom down-cheeked peaches, swart-headed mulberries, Wild free-born cranberries, Crab apples, dewberries, pineapples, blackberries, apricots, strawberries, all ripe together in summer weather. Morns that pass by, fair eaves that fly, come by, come by. Our grapes fresh from the vine, pomegranates full and fine, dates and sharps, bullaces, rare pears and green gauges, damsons and bilberries, taste them and try. Currants and gooseberries, bright fire like barberries, figs to fill your mouth. Citrons from the south, sweet to tongue and sound to eye, come by, come by. Evening by evening, among the rookside brushes, Laura bowed her head to hear, Lizzie veiled her blushes. Crouching close together, in the cooling weather, with clasping arms and cautioning lips, with tingling cheeks and fingertips. Lie close, Laura said, pricking up her golden head. We must not look at goblin men, we must not buy their fruits. Who knows upon what soil they fed their hungry, thirsty roots? Come by, called the goblins, hobbling down the glen. Oh, cried Lizzie, Laura, Laura, you should not peep at goblin men. Lizzie covered up her eyes, covered close, lest they should look. Laura reared her glossy head and whispered like the restless brook. Look, Lizzie, look, Lizzie, down the glen tramp little men. One hauls a basket, one bears a plate, one lugs a golden dish of many pounds weight. How fair the vine must grow, whose grapes are so luscious! How warm the wind must blow through those fruit bushes! No, said Lizzie, no, 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 their offers should not charm us, their evil gifts would harm us. She thrust a dimpled finger in each ear, shut eyes, and ran. Curious Laura chose to linger, wondering at each merchant man. One had a cat's face, one whisked a tail, one tramped at a rat's pace, one crawled like a snail, one like a wombat prowled obtuse and furry, one like a rattle tumbled hurried scurry. She heard a voice like voice of doves cooling all together. They sounded kind and full of loves in pleasant weather. Laura stretched her gleaming neck like a rush embedded swan, like a lily from the beck, like a moonlit poplar branch, like a vessel at the launch when its last restraint is gone. Backwards up the mossy glen turned and trooped the goblin men, with their shrill repeated cry, Come by, come by. 
When they reached where Laura was, they stood stock still upon the moss, leering at each other, brother with queer brother, signaling each other, brother with sly brother. One set his basket down, one reared his plate, one began to weave a crown of tendrils, nuts, and rough nuts brown. Men sell not such in any town. One heaved the golden weight of dish and fruit to offer her. Come by, come by, was still their cry. Laura stared, but did not stir, longed, but had no money. The whisk-tailed merchant bade her taste in tones as smooth as honey. The cat-faced purred, the rat-faced spoke a word of welcome, and the snail-paste even was heard. One parrot-voiced and jolly cried, Pretty goblin, still for pretty Polly. One whistled like a bird. But sweet-toothed Laura spoke in haste, Good folk, I have no coin to take were to purloin. I have no copper in my purse, I have no silver either, and all my gold is on the furs that shakes in windy weather above the rusty heather. You have much gold upon your head, they answered all together. Buy from us with a golden curl. She clipped a precious golden lock. She dropped a tear more rare than pearl, then sucked their fruit globes, fair or red, sweeter than honey from the rock, stronger than man rejoicing wine, clearer than water flowed that juice. She never tasted such before, of how should it cloy with length of use. She sucked and sucked and sucked the more fruits which that unknown orchard bore. She sucked until her lips were sore, then flung the emptied rinds away, but gathered up one kernel stone, and knew it not was night or day as she turned home alone. Lizzie met her at the gate, full of wise upbraidings. Dear, you should not stay so late. Twilight is not good for maidens. Should not loiter in the glen in the haunts of goblin men. Do you not remember Jeanie, how she met them in the moonlight, took their gifts, both choice and many, ate their fruits and wore their flowers, plucked from bowers where summer ripens at all hours? But never in the, but ever in the noonlight she pined and pined away, sought them by night and day, found them no more, but dwindled and grew gray, then fell with the first snow, while to this day no grass will grow where she lies low. I planted daisy there a year ago that never blow. You should not loiter so. Nay, hush, said Laura. Nay, hush, my sister. I ate and ate my fill, yet my mouth waters still. Tomorrow night I will buy more, and kissed her. Have done with sorrow. I'll bring you plums tomorrow, fresh on their mother twigs, cherries worth getting. You cannot think what figs my teeth have met in, what melons icy cold, piled on a dish of gold, too huge for me to hold, what peaches with a velvet nap, pellucid grapes without one seed. Odorous indeed must be the mead whereon they grow, and pure the great wave they drink while lilies at their brink, and sugar sweet their sap. Golden head by golden head, like two pigeons in one nest, folded in each other's wings, they lay down in their curtained bed. Like two blossoms on one stem, like two flakes of new-fallen snow, like two wands of ivory tipped with gold for awful kings. Moon and stars gazed in at them, wind sang to them a lullaby, lumbering owls forbore to fly, not a bat flapped to and fro round their rest, cheek to cheek and breast to breast, locked together in one nest. Early in the morning, when the first cock crowed his warning, neat like bees, as sweet and busy, Laura rose with Lizzie, fetched in honey, milked the cows, aired and set to right the house, kneaded cakes of whitest wheat, cakes for dainty mouths to eat, next churned butter, whipped up cream, fed their poultry, sat and sewed, talked as modest maidens should, busy with an open heart, Laura in an absent dream, one content, one sick in part, one warbling for the mere bright day's delight, one longing for the night. At length slow evening came. They went with pitchers to the reedy brook, Lizzie most placid in her look, Laura most like a leaping flame. They drew the gurgling wood water from its deep, Lizzie plucked purple and rich golden flags, then turning homeward said, The sunset flushes those furthest loftiest crags. Come, Laura, not another maiden lags. No willful squirrel wags. The beasts and birds are fast asleep. But Laura loitered still among the rushes, and said the bank was steep. 
and said the hour was early still, and dew not fallen, the wind not chill, listening ever, but not catching the customary cry, come by, come by, with its iterated jingle of sugar-baited words, not for all her watching, once discerning even one goblin, racing, whisking, tumbling, hobbling let alone the herds that used to tramp along the glen in groups or single of brisk fruit-merchant men. Till Lizzie urged, O oh, Laura, come, I hear the fruit call, but I dare not look. You should not loiter long at the brook. Come with me home. The stars rise, the moon bends her arc, each glowworm winks her spark. Let us get home before the night grows dark, for many clouds may gather, through, though this is summer weather. Put out the lights and drench us through, and then if we lost our way, what should we do? Laura turned as cold and stone to find her sister heard that cry alone, that goblin cry, come buy our fruits, come buy. Must she then buy no more such dainty fruit? Must she no more such such succus pasture find, gone deaf and blind? Her tree of life drooped from the root. She said not one word in her heart's sore ache, but peering through the dimness, not discerning, trudged home, her pitcher dripping all the way. So crept to bed, and lay silent till Lizzie slept, then sat up in a passionate yearning, and gnashed her teeth for balk desire, and wept as if her heart would break. Day after day, night after night, Laura kept watch in vain, in sullen silence of exceeding pain. She never caught again the goblin cry, Come by, come by. She never spied the goblin men, hawking their fruits along the glen. But when the noon waxed bright, her hair grew thin and grey. She dwindled as the fair full moon doth turn to swift decay and burn her fire away. One day, remembering her colonel storm, she set it by a wall that faced the south, dewed it with tears, hoped for a root, watched for a waxing shoot. But there came none. It never saw the sun, it never felt the trickling moisture run, while with sunk eyes and faded mouth she dreamed of melons as a traveller sees false waves in a desert truth with shade of leaf-crowned trees, and burns the thirstier in the sandful breeze. She no more swept the house, tended the fowls or cows, fetched honey, kneaded cakes of wheat, brought water from the brook, but sat down listless in the chimney-nook and would not eat. Tender Lizzie could not bear to watch her sister's cantankerous care, yet not to share. She night and morning caught the goblin's cry, Come by our orchard fruits, come by, come by. Beside the brook, along the glen, she heard the tramp of goblin men. The oaken stir poor Laura could not hear, longed to buy fruit to comfort her, but feared to pay too dear. She thought of Jeanie in her grave, who should have been a bride, but who for joy brides hoped to have fell sick and died in her gay prime, in earliest winter time, with the first glazing rhyme, with the first snowfall of crisp winter time. Till Laura dwindling seemed knocking at death's door, then Lizzie weighed no more, better and worse, but put a silver penny in her purse, kissed Laura, crossed the heath with clumps of firs at twilight, halted by the brook, and for the first time in her life began to listen and look. Laughed every goblin when they spied her peeping, came towards her hobbling, flying, running, leaping, puffing and blowing, chuckling, clapping, crowing, clucking and gobbling, mopping and mowing, full of airs and graces, pulling wry faces, demure grimaces, cat-like and rat-like, rattle and wombat-like, snail-paced in a hurry, parrot voice and whistler, helter-skelter, hurry-scurry, chattering like magpies, fluttering like pigeons, gliding like fishes, hugged her and kissed her, squeezed and caressed her, stretched up their dishes, panniers and plates, look at our apples, russet and dun, bob at our cherries, bite at our peaches, cit citrons and dates, grapes for the asking, pears red with basking out in the sun, plums on their twigs, pluck them and suck them, pomegranates, figs. Good folk, said Lizzie, mindful of Jeanie, give me much and many, held out her apron, tossed them her penny. Nay, take a seat with us, honour and eat with us, they'd answer grinning. Our feast is but beginning, night yet is early, warm and dew pearly, wakeful and starry. Such fruits as these no man can carry. Half their bloom would fly, half their dew would dry, half their flavour would pass by. 
sit down and feast with us, be welcome, guest with us, cheer you and rest with us. Thank you, said Lizzie, but one waits at home alone for me. So without further parleying, if you will not sell me any of your fruits through much and many, give me back my silver penny I tossed you for a fee. They began to scratch their pates, no longer wagging, purry, but visibly demurring, grunting and snarling. One called her proud, cross-grained, uncivil. Their tones waxed loud, their looks were evil. Lashing their tails, they trod and hustled her, elbowed and jostled her, clawed with their nails, barking, mewing, hissing, mocking, tore her gown and soiled her stocking, twitched her hair out by the roots, stamped upon her tender feet, held her hands and squeezed their fruits against her mouth to make her eat. White and golden Lizzie stood, like a lily in a flood, like a rock of blue-veined stone lashed by tides obstreperously, like a beacon left alone in a hoary roaring sea, sending up a golden fire, like a fruit-crowned orange tree, white with blossoms honey-sweet, sore beset by wasp and bee, like a royal virgin town topped with gilded dome and spire, close beleaguered by a fleet mad to hug her standard down. One may lead a horse to water, twenty cannot make him drink. Though the goblins cuffed and caught her, coaxed and fought her, bullied and besought her, scratched her, pinched her black as ink, kicked and knocked her, mauled and mocked her, Lizzie uttered not a word, would not open lip from lip, lest they should cram a mouthful in, but laughed in heart to feel the drip of juice that syrupped all her face, and lodged in dimples of her chin, and streaked her neck which quaked like curd. At last the evil people, worn out by her resistance, flung back her penny, kicked their fruit along whichever road they took, not leaving root or stone or shoot. Some writhed into the ground, some dived into the brook with ring and ripple, some scudded on the gale without a sound, some vanished in the distance. In a smart, ache, tingle, Lizzie went her way, knew not was it night or day, sprang up the bank, tore through the firs, threaded copse and dingle, and heard her penny jingle bouncing in her purse. Its bounce was music to her ear. She ran and ran as if she feared some goblin man dogged her with jibe or curse or something worse. But not one goblin scurried after, nor was she pricked by fear. The kind heart made her windy place that urged her home quite out of breath with haste and inward laughter. She cried, Laura, up the garden, did you miss me? Come and kiss me. Never mind my bruises. Hug me, kiss me, suck my juices, squeeze from goblin fruits for you, goblin pulp and goblin dew. Eat me, drink me, love me. Laura, make much of me. For your sake I have braved the glen and had to do with goblin merchant men. Laura started from her chair, flung her arms up in the air, clutched her hair. Lizzie, Lizzie, have you tasted for my sake the fruit forbidden? Must your light like mine be hidden, your young life like mine be wasted, undone in mine doing, and ruined in my ruin, thirsty, cankered, goblin-ridden? She clung about her sister, kissed and kissed and kissed her. Tears once again refreshed her shrunken eyes, dropping like rain after long sultry drouth, shaking with aguish fear and pain, she kissed and kissed her with a hungry mouth. Her lips began to scorch, that juice was wormwood to her tongue. She loathed the feast. Writhing as one possessed, she leaped and sung, rent her robe and, and wrung her hands in lamentable haste, and beat her breast. Her locks streamed like a torch, borne by a racer at full speed, or the mane of horses in their flight, or like an eagle when she stems the light straight toward the sun, or like a caged thing freed, or like a flying flag when armies run. Swift fire spread through her veins, knocked at her heart, met the fire smouldering there and overbore its lesser flame. She gorged on bitterness without name. Ah, fool to choose such part of soul-consuming care, since failed in the mortal strife. Like the watchtower of a town which an earthquake shatters down, like a lightning-stricken mast, like a wind-uprooted tree spun about, like a foam-tropped waterspout cast down headlong in the sea, she fell at last. Pleasure passed and anguish passed. Is it death or is it life? Life out of death. That night long, Lizzie watched by her, counted her pulses flagging stir, felt for her breath, held water to her lips and cooled her face with tears and fanning leaves. 
but when the first birds chirped about their eaves, and early reapers plodded to the place of golden sheaves, and dew-wet grass bowed in the morning wind so brisk to pass, and new buds with new day opened of cup-like lilies on the stream, Laura awoke as from a dream, laughed in the innocent old way, hugged Lizzie, but not twice or thrice. Her gleaming locks showed not one thread of grey. Her breath was sweet as May, and light danced in her eyes. Days, weeks, months, years afterwards, when both were wives with children of their own, their mother hearts beset with fears, their lives bound up with in tender lives, Laura would call the little ones and tell them of her early prime, those pleasant days long gone of not returning time, would talk about the haunted glen, the wicked quaint fruit merchant men, their fruits like honey to the throat, but poison in the blood. Men sell not such in any town. Would tell them how her sister good, in deadly peril to, to do her good, and win the fiery antidote. Then joining hands to little hands would bid them cling together, for there is no friend like a sister in calm or stormy weather, to cheer one on the tedious way, to fetch one if one goes astray, to lift one if one totters down, to strengthen whilst one stands. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Lines Written in the Vale of Chamonix by Percy Bysshe Shelley The everlasting universe of things flows through the mind, and rolls its rapid waves, now dark, now glittering, now reflecting gloom, now lending splendor, where from secret springs the source of human thought its tribute brings of waters, with a sound but half its own, such as a feeble brook will oft assume, in the wild woods, among the mountains lone, where waterfalls around it leap forever, where woods and winds contend, and a vast river over its rocks ceaselessly bursts and raves. Thus thou, ravine of Arve, dark, deep ravine, thou many-colored, many-voiced vale, over whose pines and crags and caverns sail fast cloud-shadows and sunbeams, awful scene, where power in likeness of the Arve comes down from the ice-gulfs that gird his secret throne, Bursting through these dark mountains Like the flame of lightning through the tempest. Thou dost lie, thy giant brood of pines Around thee clinging, children of elder time, In whose devotion the chainless winds Still come and ever came to drink their odors, And their mighty swinging to hear An old and solemn harmony. Thine earthly rainbows stretched across the sweep of the ethereal waterfall, whose veil robes some unsculptured image. The strange sleep which, when the voices of the desert fail, wraps all in its own deep eternity. Thy caverns echoing to the Arve's commotion, a loud, lone sound no other sound can tame. Thou art pervaded with that ceaseless motion, Thou art the path of that unresting sound, Dizzy ravine. And when I gaze on thee, I seem as in a trance sublime and strange, To muse on my own separate fantasy, My own, my human mind, Which passively now renders and receives fast influencings, holding an unremitting interchange with the clear universe of things around, one legion of wild thoughts, whose wandering wings now float above thy darkness, and now rest where that or thou art no unbidden guest, in the still cave of the witch poesy, seeking among the shadows that pass by ghosts of all things that are, some shade of thee, some phantom, some faint image. 
till the breast from which they fled recalls them, thou art there. Some say that gleams of a remoter world visit the soul in sleep, that death is slumber, and that its shapes the busy thoughts outnumber of those who wake and live. I look on high, has some unknown omnipotence unfurled the veil of life and death? Or do I lie and dream, and does the mightier world of sleep spread far around and inaccessibly its circles? For the very spirit fails, driven like a homeless cloud from steep to steep that vanishes among the viewless gales. Far, far above, piercing the infinite sky, Mont Blanc appears, still, snowy, and serene. Its subject mountains, their unearthly forms pile around it, ice and rock, broad vales between of frozen floods, unfathomable deeps, blue as the overhanging heaven, that spread and wind among the accumulated steeps. A desert peopled by the storms alone, save when the eagle brings some hunter's bone, and the wolf tracks her there. How hideously its shapes are heaped around, rude, bare, and high, ghastly, and scarred, and riven. Is this the scene where the old earthquake demon taught her young ruin? Were these their toys, or did a sea of fire envelop once this silent snow? None can reply, all seems eternal now. The wilderness has a mysterious tongue which teaches awful doubt, or faith so mild, so solemn, so serene, that man may be, but for such faith, with nature reconciled. Thou hast a voice, great mountain, to repeal large codes of fraud and woe, not understood by all, but which the wise and great and good interpret, or make felt, or deeply feel. The fields, the lakes, the forests, and the streams, ocean, and all the living things that dwell within the daedal earth, lightning and rain, Earthquake and fiery flood and hurricane, The torpor of the year when feeble dreams Visit the hidden buds, or dreamless sleep Holds every future leaf and flower. The bound with which from that detested trance they leap, The works and ways of man, their death and birth, And that of him and all that his may be. All things that move and breathe with toil and sound are born and die, revolve, subside, and swell. Power dwells apart in its tranquillity, remote, serene, and inaccessible. And this, the naked countenance of earth on which I gaze, even these primeval mountains teach the adverting mind. The glaciers creep like snakes that watch their prey from their far fountains, slow rolling on. There, many a precipice, frost and the sun, in scorn of mortal power, have piled. Dome, pyramid, and pinnacle, a city of death, distinct with many a tower and wall impregnable of beaming ice. Yet not a city, but a flood of ruin is there that from the boundaries of the sky rolls its perpetual stream. Vast pines are strewing its destined path, or in the mangled soil branchless and shattered stand. The rocks, drawn down from yon remotest waste, have overthrown the limits of the dead and living world, never to be reclaimed. The dwelling place of insects, beasts, and birds becomes its spoil, their food and their retreat forever gone, so much of life and joy is lost. The race of man flies far in dread, his work and dwelling vanish, like smoke before the tempest's stream, and their place is not known. Below, vast caves shine in the rushing torrent's relentless gleam, 
which from those secret chasms in tumult welling meet in the vale and one majestic river the breath and blood of distant lands for ever rolls its loud waters to the ocean waves breathes its swift vapors to the circling air mont blanc yet gleams on high the power is there the still and solemn power of many sights and many sounds and much of life and death in the calm darkness of the moonless nights in the lone glare of day the snows descend upon that mountain none beholds them there nor when the flakes burn in the sinking sun or the starbeams dart through them winds contend silently there and heap the snow with breath rapid and strong but silently its home the voiceless lightning in these solitudes keeps innocently and like vapor broods over the snow the secret strength of things which governs thought and to the infinite dome of heaven is as a law inhabits thee and what were thou and earth and stars and sea if to the human mind's imaginings silence and solitude were vacancy end of poem this recording is in the public domain Portrait of a Lady by T. S. Eliot. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Kirsten Ferreri. Among the smoke and fog of a December afternoon, you have the scene arrange itself, as it will seem to do, with I have saved this afternoon for you, and four wax candles in the darkened room, four rings of light upon the ceiling overhead, an atmosphere of Juliet's tomb prepared for all the things to be said or left unsaid. We have been, let us say, to hear the latest Pole transmit the preludes through his hair and fingertips. So intimate, this Chopin, that I think his soul should be resurrected only among friends, some two or three who will not touch the bloom that is rubbed and questioned in the concert-room. And so the conversation slips among velleities and carefully caught regrets through attenuated tones of violins mingled with remote cornets, and begins. You do not know how much they mean to me, my friends, and how, how rare and strange it is to find in a life composed so much, so much of odds and ends, for indeed I do not love it. You knew? You are not blind, how keen you are! To find a friend who has these qualities, who has and gives those qualities upon which friendship lives, how much it means that I say this to you! Without these friendships, life, what cauchemar! Among the windings of the violins, and the ariettes of cracked cornets, inside my brain a dull tom-tom begins, absurdly hammering a prelude of its own, capricious monotone that is at least one definite false note. Let us take the air in a tobacco trance, admire the monuments, discuss the late events, correct our watches by the public clocks, then sit for half an hour and drink our box. Now that lilacs are in bloom, she has a bowl of lilacs in her room, and twists one in her fingers while she talks. Ah, my friend, you do not know, you do not know what life is, you who hold it in your hands slowly twisting the lilac stalks. You let it flow from you, you let it flow, and youth is cruel, and has no remorse, and smiles at situations which it cannot see. I smile, of course, and go on drinking tea. Yet with these April sunsets that somehow recall my buried life, and Paris in the spring, I feel immeasurably at peace, and find the world to be wonderful and youthful after all. The voice returns like the insistent out-of-tune of a broken violin on an August afternoon. I am always sure that you understand my feelings, always sure that you feel, sure that across the gulf you reach your hand. You are invulnerable, you have no Achilles heel. You will go on, and when you have prevailed you can say, at this point many a one has failed. But what have I? But what have I, my friend, to give you? What can you receive from me? 
only the friendship and the sympathy of one about to reach her journey's end. I shall sit here, serving tea to friends. I take my hat. How can I make a cowardly amends for what she has said to me? You will see me any morning in the park, reading the comics and the sporting page. Particularly, I remark, an English countess goes upon the stage. A Greek was murdered at a Polish dance. Another bank defaulter has confessed. I keep my countenance. I remain self-possessed, except when a street piano, mechanical and tired, reiterates some worn-out common song with the smell of hyacinths across the garden, recalling things that other people have desired. Are these ideas right or wrong? The October night comes down. Returning as before, except for a slight sensation of being ill at ease, I mount the stairs and turn the handle of the door and feel as if I had mounted on my hands and knees. And so you are going abroad. And when do you return? But that's a useless question. You hardly know when you are coming back. You will find so much to learn. My smile falls heavily among the bric-a-brac. Perhaps you can write to me. My self-possession flares up for a second. This is as I had reckoned. I have been wondering frequently of late, but our beginnings never know our ends, why we have not developed into friends. I feel like one who smiles, and turning shall remark suddenly, his expression in a glass. My self-possession gutters, we are really in the dark. For everybody said so, all our friends, they all were sure our feelings would relate so closely. I myself can hardly understand. We must now leave it to fate. You will write at any rate, perhaps it is not too late. I shall sit here, serving tea to friends, and I must borrow every changing shape to find expression. Dance, dance like a dancing bear, cry like a parrot, chatter like an ape. Let us take the air in a tobacco trance. Well, and what if she should die some afternoon? Afternoon gray and smoky, evening yellow and rose, should die and leave me sitting, pen in hand, with the smoke coming down above the housetops, doubtful for a while not knowing what to feel, or if I understand, or whether wise or foolish, tardy or too soon. Would she not have the advantage after all? This music is successful with a dying fall, now that we talk of dying. And should I have the right to smile? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, as first printed in Lyrical Ballads, 1798, by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Read by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, February 2007. The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner in Seven Parts Argument How a ship, having passed the line, was driven by storms to the cold country towards the South Pole and how from thence she made her course to the tropical latitude of the great Pacific Ocean, and of the strange things that befell, and in what manner the ancient mariner came back to his own country. 1. It is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three. By thy long gray beard and thy glittering eye, now wherefore stoppest me? The bridegroom's doors are open wide, and I am next of kin. The guests are met, the feast is set, mayst hear the merry din? But still he holds the wedding guest. There was a ship, quoth he. Nay, if thou got a laughsome tale, mariner, come with me. He holds him with his skinny hand, quoth he. There was a ship. Now get thee hence, thy greybeard loon, or my staff shall make thee skip. He holds him with his glittering eye. The wedding guest stood still, and listens like a three years child. The mariner hath his will. 
The wedding guest sat on a stone, he cannot choose but hear. And thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. The ship was cheered, the harbor cleared, merrily did we drop. Below the kirk, below the hill, below the lighthouse top. The sun came up upon the left, out of the sea came he, and he shone bright and on the right went down into the sea. Higher and higher every day, till over the mast at noon. The wedding guest here beat his breast, for he heard the loud bassoon. The bride hath packed into the hall, red as a rose is she. Nodding their heads before her goes the merry minstrelsy. The wedding guest he beat his breast, yet he cannot choose but hear, and thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. Listen, stranger, storm and wind, a wind and tempest strong, for days and weeks it played us freaks, like chaff we drove along. Listen, stranger, mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold, and the ice mast high came floating by, as green as emerald. And through the drifts, the snowy cliffs did send a dismal sheen, ne shapes of men, ne beasts we ken, the ice was all between. The ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around, it cracked and growled and roared and howled, like noises of a swound. At length did come an albatross, through the fog it came, and an it were a Christian soul. We hailed it in God's name. The mariners gave it biscuit worms, and round and round it flew. The ice did split with a thunder fit. The helmsman steered us through. And a good south wind sprung up behind. The albatross did follow. And every day for food or play came to the mariners' hollow. In mist or cloud, on mast or shroud, it perched for vespers nine. Whiles all the night through fog-smoke white glimmered the white moonshine. God save thee, ancient mariner, from the fiends that plague thee thus. Why lookst thou so? With my crossbow I shot the albatross. 2. The sun came up upon the right, out of the sea came he, and brought us a weft upon the left went down into the sea. And the good south wind still blew behind, but no sweet bird did follow. Nay, any day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow. And I had done an ellish thing, and it would work em woe, for all averred I had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow. Knee dim, knee red, like God's own head the glorious sun uprist. Then all averred I had killed the bird that brought the fog and mist. "'Twas right,' said they, such birds to slay, that bring the fog and mist. The breezes blew, the white foam flew, the furrowed followed free. We were the first that ever burst into that silent sea. Down dropped the breeze, the sails dropped down, "'twas sad as sad could be and we did speak only to break the silence of the sea. All in a hot and copper sky, the bloody sun at noon, right up above the mast did stand, no bigger than the moon. Day after day, day after day, we stuck, ne breath, ne motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nay any drop to drink. The very deeps did rot, O Christ, that ever this should be. Yea, slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea. About, about, in reel and rout, the death fires danced at night. The water, like a witch's oils, burned green and blue and white. And some in dreams, assured were, of the spirit that plagued us so. Nine fathom deep he had followed us from the land of mist and snow. And every tongue through utter drought was withered at the root 
we could not speak no more than if we had been choked with soot. Ah, well a day, what evil looks had I from old and young. Instead of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung. 3. I saw a something in the sky no bigger than my fist. At first it seemed a little speck, and then it seemed a mist. It moved and moved, and took at last a certain shape I wist. A speck, a mist, a shape I wist, and still it neared and neared. And, and it dodged a water sprite, it plunged and tacked and veered. With throat unslaked, with black lips baked, ne could we laugh ne wail. Then while through drouth all dumb they stood, I bit my arm and sucked the blood and cried, A sail! A sail! With throat unslaked, with black lips baked, the gape they heard me call. Grab mercy, they for joy did grin, and all at once their breath drew in as they were drinking all. She doth not tack from side to side, hither to work us wheel. Without in wind, without in tide, she steadies with upright keel. The western wave was all aflame, the day was well nigh done. Almost upon the western wave rested the broad, bright sun, when that strange ship drove suddenly betwixt us and the sun. And straight the sun was flecked with bars, heaven's mother send us grace, as if through a dungeon great he peered with a broad and burning face. Alas! thought I, my heart beating loud, how fast she nears and nears! Are those her sails that glance in the sun, like restless gossamers? Are those her naked ribs which flecked, the sun that did behind them peer? And are these two all, all the crew? that woman and her fleshless fear? His bones were black with many a crack, all black and bare, I ween, jet black and bare, save where the rust of moldy damps and charnel crust, they're patched with purple and green. Her lips are red, her looks are free, her locks are yellow as gold. Her skin is as white as leprosy, and she is far like her death than he. Her flesh makes the still air cold. The naked hulk alongside came, and the twain were playing dice. The game is done, I've won, I've won, quoth she, and whistled thrice. A gust of wind stirred up behind, and whistled through his bones, through the holes of his eyes and the hole of his mouth, half whistles and half groans. With never a whisper in the sea, off darts the specter ship. While clomb above the eastern bar, the horned moon with one bright star almost between the tips. One after one by the horned moon, listen, O stranger, to me. Each turned his face with a ghastly pang and cursed me with his e. Four times fifty living men with never a sigh or groan. With a heavy thump, a lifeless lump, they dropped down one. By one. Their souls did from their bodies fly, they fled to bliss or woe, and every soul it passed me by, like the whiz of my crossbow. Four. I fear thee, ancient mariner, I fear thy skinny hand. And thou art long and lank and brown as the rib sea sand. I fear thee in thy glittering eye and thy skinny hand so brown. Fear not, fear not, thou wedding guest. This body dropped not down. Alone, alone. All, all alone. Alone on the wide, wide sea. And Christ would take no pity on my soul in agony. The many men so beautiful, and they all dead did lie, and a million million slimy things lived on, and so did I. I looked upon the rotting sea and drew my eyes away. I looked upon the eldritch deck, and there the dead men lay. I looked to heaven and tried to pray, but or ever a prayer had gushed. A wicked whisper came and made my heart as dry as dust. 
I closed my lids and kept them closed till the balls like pulses beat, for the sky and the sea and the sea and the sky lay like a load on my weary eye, and the dead were at my feet. The cold sweat melted from their limbs, knee rot, near raked did they. The look with which they looked on me had never passed away. An orphan's curse would drag to hell a spirit from on high, but oh, more horrible than that is the curse in a dead man's eye. Seven days, seven nights, I saw that curse, and yet I could not die. The moving moon went up the sky, and nowhere did abide. Softly she was going up, and a star or two beside. Her beams bemocked the sultry main, like morning frosty spread. But where the ship's huge shadow lay, the charmed water burnt all way a still and awful red. Beyond the shadow of the ship I watched the water snakes. They moved in tracks of shining white, and when they reared their elfish light fell off in hoary flakes. Within the shadow of the ship I watched their rich attire. Blue, glossy green, and velvet black, they coiled and swam, and every track was a flash of golden fire. Oh, happy living things! No tongue their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them unaware. Sure my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed them unaware. The self-same moment I could pray, and from my neck so free the albatross fell off and sank, like lead into the sea. 5. O oh, sleep, it is a gentle thing, beloved from pole to pole. To Mary Queen the praise be given, she sent the gentle sleep from heaven that slid into my soul. The silly buckets on the deck that had so long remained, I dreamt that they were filled with dew, and when I awoke it rained. My lips were wet, my throat was cold, my garments all were dank. Sure I had drunken in my dreams, and still my body drank. I moved, and could not feel my limbs. I was so light. Almost I thought that I had died in sleep, and was a blessed ghost. The roaring wind, it roared far off, it did not come anear. But with its sound it shook the sails that were so thin and sere. The upper air burst into life, and a hundred fire flags sheen. To and fro they are hurried about, and to and fro and in and out the stars dance on between. The coming wind doth roar more loud, the sails do sigh like sedge. The rain pours down from one black cloud, and the moon is at its edge. Hark! Hark! The thick black cloud is cleft, and the moon is at its side, like water shot from some high crag. The lightning falls with never a jag, a river steep and wide. The strong wind reached the ship, it roared and dropped down like a stone. Beneath the lightning and the moon, the dead men gave a groan. They groaned, they stirred, they all uprose, ne spake, ne moved their eyes. It had been strange, even in a dream, to have seen those dead men rise. The helmsman steered, the ship moved on, yet never a breeze up blew. The mariners all gan work the ropes where they were wont to do. They raised their limbs like lifeless tools, we were a ghastly crew. The body of my brother's son stood by me knee to knee. The body and I pulled at one rope, but he said naught to me. And I quaked to think of my own voice, how frightful it would be. The daylight dawned, they dropped their arms and clustered round the mast. Sweet sounds rose slowly through their mouths and from their bodies passed. Around, around flew each sweet sound and darted to the sun. Slowly the sounds came back again, now mixed, now one by one. Sometimes a dropping from the sky I heard the laugh rock sing. Sometimes all little birds that are. How they seem to fill the sea and are with their sweet jargoning. And now t'was like all instruments, now like a lonely flute, and now it is an angel song that makes the heavens be mute. It ceased, yet still the sails made on a pleasant noise till noon, a noise like of a hidden brook, 
in the leafy month of June, that to the sleeping woods all night singeth a quiet tune. Listen, O oh listen, thou wedding guest! Mariner, thou hast thy will, for that which comes out of thine eye doth make my body and soul to be still. Never sadder tale was told to a man of woman born. Sadder and wiser, thou wedding guest, thou rise to-morrow morn. Never sadder tale was heard by a man of woman born. The mariners all returned to work as silent as before. The mariners all gan pulled the ropes, but looked at me they knowed. Thought I, I am as thin as air, they cannot me behold. Till noon we silently sailed on, yet never a breeze did breathe. Slowly and smoothly went to ship, moved onward from beneath. Under the keel nine fathom deep from the land of mist and snow, the spirit slid, and it was he that made the ship to go. The sails at noon left off their tune, and the ship stood still also. The sun right up above the mast had fixed her to the ocean, but in a minute she gan stir with a short uneasy motion, backwards and forwards half their length with a short uneasy motion. Then, like a pawing horse let go, she made a sudden bound. It flung the blood into my head, and I fell into a swound. How long in that same fit I lay, I have not to declare. But ere my living life returned, I heard, and in my soul discerned two voices on the air. Is it he? quoth one. Is this the man, by him who died on the cross? With his cruel bow he laid full low the harmless albatross? The spirit who bideth by himself in the land of mist and snow, he loved the bird that loved the man who shot him with his bow. The other was a softer voice, as soft as honey-dew. Quoth he, The man hath penance done, and penance more will do. Six. First voice. But tell me, tell me, speak again, thy soft response renewing. What makes that ship drive on so fast? What is the ocean doing? Second voice. Still as a slave before his lord, the ocean hath no blast. His great bright eye most silently up to the moon is cast. If he may know which way to go, for she guides him smooth or grim. See, brother, see, how graciously she looketh down on him. First voice. But why drives on that ship so fast, without in wave or wind? Second voice. The air is cut away before, and closes from behind. Fly, brother, fly, more high, more high, or we shall be belated, for slow and slow that ship will go, when the mariner's trance is abated. I woke, and we were sailing on, as in a gentle weather. Twas night, calm night, the moon was high, the dead men stood together. All stood together on the deck for a charnel dungeon fitter, all fixed on me their stony eyes that in the moon did glitter. The pang, the curse with which they died, had never passed away. I could not draw my e'en from theirs, and he turned them up to pray. And in its time the spell was snapped, and I could move my e'en. I looked far forth, but little saw of what might else be seen. Like one that on a lonely road doth walk in fear or dread, and having once turned round walks on and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. But soon there breathed the wind on me, ne sound ne motion made. Its path was not upon the sea, in ripple or in shade. It raised my hair, it fanned my cheek like a meadow gale of spring. It mingled strangely with my fears, yet it felt like a welcoming. Swiftly, swiftly flew the ship, yet she sailed softly too. Sweetly, sweetly blew the breeze, on me alone it blew. O oh, dream of joy, is this indeed the lighthouse top I see? Is this the hill? Is this the kirk? Is this mine own country? We drifted o'er the harbor bar, and I would sobs did pray, O oh, let me be awake, my God, or let me sleep alway. 
The harbor bay was clear as glass, so smoothly it was strewn, and on the bay the moonlight lay and the shadow of the moon. The moonlight bay was white all o'er, till rising from the same, full many shapes that shadows were, like as of torches came. A little distance from the prow those dark red shadows were, but soon I saw that my own flesh was red as in a glare. I turned my head in fear and dread, and by the holy rood the bodies had advanced, and now before the mass they stood. They lifted up their stiff right arms, they held them straight and tight, and each right arm burnt like a torch, a torch that borne upright. Their stony eyeballs glittered on in the red and smoky light. I prayed, and turned my head away, forth looking as before. There was no breeze upon the bay, no wave against the shore. The rock shone bright, the kirk no less that stands above the rock. The moonlight steeped in silentness, the steady weather cock. And the bay was white with silent light, till rising from the same, full many shapes that shadows were in crimson colors came. A little distance from the prow those crimson shadows were, I turned my eyes upon the deck. Oh, Christ, what I saw there! Each course lay flat, lifeless and flat, and by the holy rood, a man all light, a seraph man, on every course there stood. This seraph band each waved his hand, it was a heavenly sight. They stood as signals to the land, each one a lovely light. This seraph band each waved his hand, no voice did they impart, no voice, but oh, the silence sank like music on my heart. F. Stoons, I heard the dash of oars, I heard the pilot cheer, my head was turned perforce away, and I saw a boat appear. Then vanished all the lovely lights, the bodies rose anew, with silent pace each to his place came back the ghastly crew. The wind that shade nor motion made, on me alone it blew. The pilot and the pilot's boy, I heard them coming fast. Dear Lord in heaven, it was a joy the dead men could not blast. I saw a third, I heard his voice. It is the hermit, good. He singeth loud his godly hymns that he makes in the wood. He'll shrieve my soul, he'll wash away the albatross's blood. Seven. This hermit good lives in that wood which slopes down to the sea. How loudly his sweet voice he rears! He loves to talk with mariners that come from a far country. He kneels at morn and noon and eve. He hath a cushion plump. It is the moss that wholly hides the rotted old oak stump. The skiff boat neared. I heard them talk. Why, this is strange, I trow. Where are those lights so many and fair that signal made but now? Strange by my faith, the hermit said, and they answered not our cheer. The planks look warped, and see those sails, how thin they are and sear. I never saw aught like to them, unless perchance it were, the skeletons of leaves that lag my forest brook along, when the ivy tod is heavy with snow, and the owlet whoops to the wolf below that eat the she-wolf's young. Dear Lord, it has a fiendish look, the pilot made reply. I am afeard. Push on, push on, said the hermit cheerily. The boat came closer to the ship, but I ne spake nor stirred. The boat came close beneath the ship, and straight a sound was heard. Under the water it rumbled on, still louder and more dread. It reached the ship, it split the bay, the ship went down like lead. Stunned by that loud and dreadful sound which sky and ocean smote, like one that had been seven days drowned, my body lay afloat. But swift as dreams myself I found within the pilot's boat. Upon the whirl where sank the ship the boat spun round and round, and all was still, save that the hill was telling of the sound. I moved my lips. The pirate shrieked and fell down in a fit. The holy hermit raised his eyes and prayed where he did sit. I took the eye, the pilot's boy, who now doth crazy go, laughed loud and long, and all the while his eyes went to and fro. Ha, ha, quoth he, full plain I see, the devil knows how to row. And now, all in mine own country, I stood on the firm land. The hermit stepped forth from the boat, and scarcely he could stand. Oh, shrieve me, shrieve me, holy man, 
The hermit crossed his brow. Say quick, quoth he, I bid thee say, What manner man art thou? For with this frame of mine was wrenched with a woeful agony, Which forced me to begin my tale, and then it left me free. Since then, at an uncertain hour, now oftentimes now fewer, That anguish comes and makes me tell my ghastly adventure. I pass like night from land to land, I have strange power of speech. The moment that his face I see, I know the man that must hear me, To him my tale I teach. What loud uproad bursts from that door? The wedding guests are there. But in the garden bower the bride and bridemaid singing are, And hark the little vesper bell, which biddeth me to prayer. O oh, wedding guest, this soul hath been alone on a wide, wide sea. So lonely twas that God himself scarce seemed there to be. O oh, sweeter than the marriage feast, this sweeter far to me, to walk together to the kirk with a goodly company, to walk together to the kirk and all together pray, while each to his great father bends, old men and babes and loving friends and youth and maidens gay. Farewell, farewell. But this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest. He prayeth well who loveth well, both man and bird and beast. He prayeth best who loveth best, all things both great and small. For the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all. The mariner, whose eye is bright, whose beard with age is hoar, is gone, and now the wedding guest turned from the bridegroom's door. He went like one that hath been stunned, and is of a sense forlorn, a sadder and a wiser man. He rose the morrow morn. End. Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge As first printed anonymously in Lyrical Ballads, 1798 Read by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, February 2007